Hello, Game Jammers. My name is Ramez Nam. I'm a storyteller. I use words to create new realities in people's imaginations. You are a storyteller too. You may not think of yourself that way, but all games innately have some sort of story. Even the simplest game of blocks or lines has something you want to accomplish, something you want to avoid, and some sort of emotional component at least going on in the mind of the player. I want to talk today about two opposing sorts of emotions in stories, the emotions of hope and of fear. This is a cyborg. This is the sort of image of man-machine technology merger that we've been exposed to. Here's a scary cyborg over years as Arnold has changed. But this isn't the only type of cyborg. In fact, it's not even the most common type of cyborg. This is a cyborg, a five-year-old girl hearing for the first time in her life with something called a cochlear implant, technology that turns sound into electrical signals delivered by wires to her brain. There are 200,000 cyborgs like this little girl who can only hear because of brain technology that we have, or like this little boy, Jonathan. Here we go, it's coming back on, and he's back on again. See how he turned? Hi, Jonathan. Stop the sucking. Yeah. Hi. Good. Could you good. hear that? <laughs> Hi, okay. sweetie. Could you hear that? <laughs> Jonathan is a cyborg, but he's not like our image of cyborgs. Or this is Jens Nauman, who was blind for 20 years and now has a bionic eye that lets him see. Jens is a cyborg. Or this woman, Jan, who's paralyzed from the neck down due to ALS, but she has control through cyborg technology of this robot arm. She can do things that were impossible for her years later. Important things like grasping a piece of chocolate and eating it. So how come our images of cyborgs focus on things like Arnold and the Terminator instead of the way that cyborg technology is actually helping people? Well, it's because we have to make things exciting. We want to capture people's attention. We want them riveted to us, to the movie, to the book, to the game they're playing, whatever it is. And so we'll pull out all the stops of action, excitement, all this sort of stuff. And if that's not enough, then we'll go further and we'll make it a bit scary one way or another. It's not just games or movies or books that do this. If you turn on the news, you'll see stories of horrible things happening. You'll see stories of murder. But they won't tell you that in countries around the world, the rate of murder has dropped by half over the last few decades because they want your attention. If it bleeds, it leads. You'll see stories of terrorist groups like ISIS, and I've got to admit, ISIS really is pretty scary. I mean, look at this stuff. Who's not terrified? When they're telling you stories about terrorists and wars all around the world, though, they won't tell you that warfare has declined tremendously over the last 70 years. I understand why this is. We evolved with predators. We evolved such that if you didn't perk up at even the possibility of a tiger in the bushes, then you might be that tiger's lunch, and you weren't going to have kids. You weren't going to pass down your genes. If you jumped ten times at ten false tigers, hmm, no problem. As long as you jump that one time, it's real. So evolution has pushed us to be hyper alert to the bad, to the scary, even more than we are to opportunities. Heck, I'm a writer. I use words. I need to keep people turning that page and focused on what I'm doing in the story. 
I mean, I wouldn't want anyone to be able to fall asleep reading one of my books. That would be terrible. They have to stay focused on my piece of entertainment, right? The first and cardinal sin is to let the audience get bored. So, I play all the same tricks. I put in whiz-bang technology about nanotech, nanobots in the brain that let people communicate nearly telepathically back and forth, and apps that run in your neural hardware, NSA back doors that can hack into your brain and maybe take control of you, and car chases, and car crashes, and martial arts fights, gunfights, gunfights that are martial arts fights, oppressive state police, Brave freedom fighters, clashes that go on epically, explosions, military battles, more explosions, more NSA agents, rogue AI is about to go wild, the threat of thermonuclear war. <sighs> That's a lot of tension. And maybe, just maybe, we would benefit as an audience and also as creators by also tapping into some other neglected emotions. So you'll find in books that I write, scenes of monks connected mind to mind, meditating together, using technology for peace. You'll find scenes of parents connecting with children to understand one another you'll find signs of protesters winning through peaceful protest. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go off and make some hippie game about utopia where nothing bad ever happens, because that would be boring. Who would play such a game? We need the excitement. We need the, the compulsion to play. We need the drama. We need the risk of loss, as well as the possibility of failure. But maybe, just maybe, it's an ingredient that we can add. Not just what to fear, but what to aspire to. Not just constant tension, but those occasional moments of beauty. So by all means, as you're working on your games over the next few days or the rest of your career, toss in the car crashes. Toss in the explosions. Heck, lots of explosions. But don't forget those little moments of joy and beauty and hope. Thanks for listening, and you know where to find me. Our last keynote is from game developer Siobhan Reddy and Media Molecule. Hi, my name is Siobhan Reddy, and I'm the studio director at a game studio called Media Molecule. What I'm here to talk to you about today is uh, Game Jams. Uh, and instead of actually just doing a talk and you watching my face, I thought I'd show you, give you a bit of insight into the jams that we've been doing here at Media Molecule. The one that you're seeing on the screen at the moment is one that we did a few years ago, and it was actually a full studio jam um, where people had the freedom to be able to create whatever they really wanted to. The idea with this jam was um, very much about having fun, collaborating together, and really sort of that idea is creating as play, which is very much a thing that we love to do. A jam is as much about the freedom to experiment as it is about ending up somewhere interesting. So whilst this time we were having, we were just having fun, uh, people did make very poignant things like Victor's um, meditation installation that we are seeing right now. Dreams is our new project, um, and the engine is a set of innovative create tools that lets players build anything that they can dream of, a picture, a character, an environment, a piece of music, a little animated short, or a fully designed video game. This jam was uh, focused around everyone working on dreams, um, using the, the dreams tool set as it was at that specific moment to be able to just tell a story. Uh, it had a dual purpose. One was to actually just sort of put the tools through their paces and for us to be able to get feedback. And the other was actually to really just sort of see what kind of stories people wanted to be able to tell.
So the final one that I'm showing you is our tearaway jam. Um, and there's a point in every game's design where you need to choose your focus. And when this moment came for tearaway, uh, the Vita became our guide. And so what you're seeing here is where we had a jam where the constraint was um, to use the Vita outputs in novel ways. They had to be able to stand the test of time and so not just be full of gimmicks. Um, so these videos you're watching are actually the dailies that we had when this jam started. For those of you who are familiar with Tearaway, uh, Vita or Unfolded, you'll actually see many familiar features actually came from this jam. Amazing camera work. <laughs> We love to record all of our dailies that we have and our Friday features because it's really fascinating to go back and have a look at, at what was happening and especially when I was putting this video together when I really saw actually you know like that jam was incredibly successful. From that we were really able to actually design the game. Every single one of these things appears in the game as a core feature and actually also then influence it unfolded in different ways. So it sort of shows that setting constraints can actually be really successful. Um, so I'll leave you to sort of watch, you know, this, this was the, the little trailer that we came up with once we'd had the jam. But it's just an important thing to note that my one piece of advice to you all sort of starting the global game jam is actually maybe figure out what your constraints are going to be so that you can really go wild within them. And I wish everybody the very best of luck. So many people help create the Global Game Jam that there are too many to list in one place.